Okay, let's go ahead and get started with today's Wellness Wednesday with Orient. My name is Anne. I'm a health coach here at Orient and our webinar moderator today. Um, I'm really excited about today's presentation. We have with us Dr. Kaylin Bavon, um, who is the Chief Wellness Officer and Assistant Professor of Medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Um, she's also the Director of the Lifestyle Program at the GW Medical Facility Associates. Um, she's a board certified preventative medicine and lifestyle medicine doctor with a focus on holistic care and my favorite part, patient empowerment. So we are so lucky and just thrilled and happy to have Dr. Prabhan with us today. She um, is going to be presenting to us today on the mind-body connection and then she will also be joining us next month for the second presentation in the series where she's going to talk about applying mind-body tools for stress management. So we are just thrilled to have her with us today. Really quick before I turn the reins over to her, I just wanted to let everybody know that your points will be applied to your um, account later today that you receive for attending and then also please participate with us as always. Um, a copy of this presentation and um, a recording will also be available to you on myoriant.com following the presentation today as well. So, Dr. Prabhan, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for the introduction, Anne. Oh. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> well, before you jump into all of you prepared, will you tell us just a little bit where this passion for um, holistic care and, and, and how you approach medicine, where did this come from with you? Oh, wow. Um, I'm going to try to give you a short answer to that question. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, you know, I, I suppose really it goes back quite a ways for me. I, I was exposed first to these concepts of kind of mindfulness and mind-body uh, probably when I was pretty young, I think back in middle school probably. Uh, I kind of came across some books that had been laying around and sort of picked them up, started reading them, and thought it kind of made some sense. Um, didn't get too far with it until I got to college and I started, you know, taking some more courses that were that were relevant. Um, and actually had a uh, roommate who had grown up in a tradition where meditation was part of their kind of family practice. And you know, I, I tell my medical students and residents now that when I got to medical school, uh, you know, it was cool if you were a runner, that was great. Uh, if you were a vegetarian, that was you know, maybe a little bit unusual, but okay, cool, that's all right. Um, meditation was not a thing that we spoke about. <laughs> and so it was something that I really kept very separate from my medical practice, really until I started getting into the practice of preventive medicine and realizing that by that point, uh, there had been kind of a surge in the amount of research that was being done in the science of mind-body. And this was enough of a resonance space to start to really support that, you know, it's not just that it's something that sort of makes me feel good, which is, you know, beneficial in and of its own right, I believe, um, but that actually there was something really happening physiologically um, that had long-term consequences. And that was something that felt like just really jived with what I had been experiencing uh, and was something that we could really use to offer more meaningful, more holistic care to our patients. So really started to dive into it at that point. That's wonderful. I feel like this is is a piece that people are really searching for. You know, it's it's gaining ground, and I think we're all learning that there's a lot more to be done than than what the traditional offering is. And so I love I love that this is your <laughs> you know what you've pulled in through your experience <laughs> and your and your passion. Also, just really quick, if for our participants who are in the Washington DC area and maybe for those nationwide, how do we access you if, if we want to, to uh, reach out to you following this presentation? Oh, today? sure, absolutely. Uh, anyone who is interested in coming to see me, I'd be thrilled to see. I, I do see patients uh, about half of my time uh, at the medical school. And uh, it's very easy to schedule. You can just call the GW Medical Faculty Associates. Um, I can get that information out to everyone. Uh, and uh, just go ahead and, and schedule a new appointment, and I'd be thrilled to see anyone who's interested. 
Perfect. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure we will be. And we're just thrilled to, to uh, <laughs> get a glimpse of your world today. So I'm going to get out of the way and just let you jump ahead. Of course, let me know when you're ready for the next slide and, and I'll hop in with any questions or comments that, that might come through as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, Anne. And, um, you know, I, I think this, uh, the, this is actually a really great jumping off point because really the, the underlying the underlying point of today's discussion really is that there, there is so much more to our health um, than just making sure that we're doing all the right things physically. And uh, this is just a fascinating area of research where there's been so much going on. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to have a conversation surrounding this. And, and when I say conversation, uh, we've been planning to say, you know, we, if anyone has any questions as I'm going or there's anything that I can clarify, um, there's no need to necessarily wait to the end. If, if it's something that is more useful to sort of just clear up as we're going, please go ahead and raise your hand as it were and, and Anna can let me know. We'll stop and just clarify or, or answer your questions. <clears throat> so, um, as you can probably see here from the um, from the name of the talk, uh, Goosebumps, Butterflies, Breaking Hearts, uh, the idea here really is, you know, let's take a look at some of this language and really the, the science behind this phenomenon of what we refer to now as mind-body. Uh, next slide, please, Anne. This is a quote that I really love. It, it's meant to describe mindfulness, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, but I think it also really applies to the limits of our knowledge as a as the field of medicine. Uh, this is from R. D. Lang, who says, "The range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice. And because we fail to notice that we fail to notice, there's little we can do to change until we notice how failing to notice shapes our thoughts and deeds." Uh, so it can take a moment to wrap your head around that. Um, but once you do, I, I think it's pretty clear that the, the application of this really goes, goes pretty broad um, when we're speaking about our health and the things that we can do to, to improve and optimize it. Next slide, please. So the model that you see here is kind of the way that we generally approach our health, um, both in our day-to-day -day lives and, unfortunately, um, in kind of conventional medical practice. We have this idea that physical health is something that we address sort of from the neck down, and mental health lives in the head uh, from the neck up, and that there really isn't a relationship between the two. Uh, we know very clearly that this is not true, not just based on our own day-to-day -day experiences, but as I mentioned previously, and we're going to be diving into today, in a very broad and very deep body of science that is growing every day. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so when we think about mind-body or when we use this term, really what it's referring to is the concept that the mind and body are interconnected. And that, as you might expect in that circumstance, the actions of the mind affect the body and the state of the body affects the mind. Next slide, please. So this has a number of different ramifications. Um, what it means in part is that we really do see through something called the relaxation response, which we'll discuss a little bit more later on, um, but is a state of kind of physical and emotional relaxation um, through the use of coping strategies, physical activity, nutrition, social support. These are all kinds of ways in which we can tap into and leverage this relationship between the mind and the body. Um, and this is a, an area of healthcare um, that kind of is housed within my areas of specialty, preventive and lifestyle medicine, uh, which we call mind-body medicine. It's really, really an important area that's been underutilized, in my opinion. So we've been using this word mindfulness. And if we go to the next slide, and I'm going to take a moment to just try to really define a little bit what it is we're talking about for anyone who's unfamiliar. The word gets used a lot. Uh, what it really means is fairly simple, but also fairly profound. This is a definition from Dr. John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts. And he described mindfulness as a way of paying attention in the present, in the present moment, and without judgment. And you can think about this as just a way of saying essentially that you are 
giving your attention in a way that is intentional, uh, intentional in where you are directing it, and that you are using your attention in a way that is um, not getting wrapped up in kind of emotional reactions um, that we might perceive as judgment, but rather that we are really getting a little bit of perspective on what it is that we are intentionally attending to. That's, that's the state of mindfulness. So how do we achieve mindfulness? Next slide, please. There are a number of different practices that we refer to as mind-body practices that are designed, so to speak, um, to help one achieve a state of mindfulness. And these are all kinds of different shapes. Uh, these can be formal or informal practices. You can be seated still or it can involve movement. You can practice alone or in a group uh, and for any length of time. These are some examples you see here. We see, think of things like Tai Chi, um, seated meditation, biofeedback, uh, walking meditation. These are all forms of mindfulness practice. Next slide, please, Anne. Uh, but the truth is that truly anything can be done mindfully because what we're speaking about is just being able to focus our attention intentionally and to do so in a way that is limiting emotional reactivity. Anything can be done that way. So whether we're really bringing our attention to a run that we're taking, a mountain that we're climbing, a dish that we're washing, any of that can be done mindfully. <clears throat> so the question then is, Okay, so we have this mindfulness practice that can bring us to this mindfulness state. Why does that matter? <laughs> what are those results? And what are the implications? So if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see here, I, I mentioned this large body of literature in the medical science. And this is just a partial list of health conditions which have been demonstrated to be caused, exacerbated by, or ameliorated by tapping into this mind-body relationship. And so some of these conditions may not be surprising to you. Uh, you may see things like anxiety and depression and think, okay, well, it makes sense that mindfulness practice might help there. Um, maybe something like low back pain, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but maybe some other conditions are more surprising to you. Uh, so for example, asthma. Uh, it's been clearly demonstrated that among the other things that are risk factors for increasing the likelihood of having an asthma exacerbation, increased stress is one of those. When we're under more emotional stress, that emotional stress re leads to increases in our body's inflammatory state. Higher inflammatory state will bring someone with asthma closer to that threshold for an asthma exacerbation. And someone who's practicing mindfulness to manage that stress can actually reverse that. So we're starting to get a little bit into what are some of the mechanisms of action. Uh, next slide. And then the next again, please, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> so how does this actually work? So we can see that it appears to be the case that when someone is engaging in mindfulness, it can help to offset some of the negative physical health consequences of being under stress. Um, but what is it that's actually happening? So there are a few proposed mechanisms here. One is what I referred to a little while ago as the stress and relaxation responses, um, states of our nervous system that are either kind of wound up or kind of more calm and quiet. There are brain waves that we see that can be different um, in stressed or mindful states. Uh, down to our cellular and even level of DNA, there are, there are found to be changes, and those can have consequences for our physical health. Uh, and even where the microbiome is concerned, which are all those kind of healthy bacteria that live in all of our kind of <laughs> corners and crevices and, and help us to do all the things that our bodies need to do. So there are proposed mechanisms through each of these um, areas that can be implicated in the ways in which mind-body functions. So next slide, please. Um, so I, I do have a couple of cats, and this is a favorite of mine. Um, I think it well demonstrates what we're talking about with the stress and relaxation responses. Uh, so in one case, um, this would be considered the activation of our stress response, uh, the kitty with the staring eyes on the right. Uh, on the left, this is an activation of our relaxation response. And we can go to the next slide, please. 
I just have to uh, say I love he's... that slide. <laughs> I just had to pop <laughs> in with that. Like That's great. I I want to be the cat on the left, just just so we know. Yes, <laughs> More that's always a really appealing look, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And what I like about the cat on the left is that you can see it looks as though he or she is still getting a little bit of work done, right? But in a really calm manner. Yeah, yeah, not just totally checked out. But <laughs> that's great. Um, so let's go to the next slide and, and what we could see here is that the stress and relaxation responses um, beyond kind of being terms that we use and throw around um, these are real physiological states that refer to measurable changes in our bodies and so the specifics here are less important than kind of just having an understanding of what it is that this can really mean um, so we are all familiar with the feeling of maybe we've received some unexpected bad news and all of a sudden we're in a state of kind of feeling hot, flushed, maybe heart rate going up. If we had a blood pressure cuff on, you might see that growing up. Um, feeling like we all of a sudden have a lot of extra energy. Um, that is a state of a stress response. Um, those are all changes that we see short term that are measurable. As it turns out, there are long term changes that occur with chronic stress as well. And those changes result in things like chronically increased blood pressure, for example, um, chronically increased uh, systemic inflammatory state uh, in a way that's measurable, um, changes in our metabolism and particularly in our sensitivity to insulin, uh, which is important for our metabolism of sugar, um, changes again down to the cellular level and even parts of our brain. Um, when we're under chronic stress, the parts of our brain that deal with things like fear um, that part of the brain called the amygdala actually gets larger. Uh, and when we are engaging a relaxation response uh, in the short term, we see the opposite. We see lower heart rate, lower respiratory rate, lower blood pressure. Uh, in the long term, people who are long-term meditators, for example, we also see the opposite long-term changes. Um, <clears throat> And uh, if we could go to, I'm actually going to have you skip the next slide, Anne, and go to the relaxation response slide. So the, the sympathetic nervous system, or the stress response, we refer to as our fight or flight. Um, the relaxation response, the parasympathetic, that's our rest and digest. And so as you can see here, these are some of the short-term changes that we know take place. Uh, in the long term, again, as I mentioned, we see changes that are even down to the level of our genes, even down to the level of actually changes in the portions of the brain that are involved in things like memory and cognition. Uh, so there are real consequences to engaging these uh, portions of our physiology. And so how do we actually do that? We've spoken about some of the ways that we can engage the relaxation response. Um, these are some suggestions from the Benson Henry Institute at Massachusetts General Hospital. They mentioned things like meditation, mindfulness, Tai Chi, yoga, um, as we discussed a few minutes ago. Um, go to the next slide, please, Anne. Uh, I would add here really a long, long list of additional ways in which we can tap into relaxation responses. Uh, I think it has become increasingly clear in the research that's out there that the particular modality that you're using is not really important. What's important is that it is helping you reach that place of a more calm, quiet, kind of focused state. And the way in which we do that is probably going to be specific to the individual to some extent. So we've been speaking about what are some of the mechanisms, what are some of the consequences. I think there's an opportunity for us now to really kind of dive in and see a little bit more specifically, what is it that the research is showing us? What do we actually see? Uh, so if we could go to the next slide. I think we're all familiar with this idea. We use this phrase that we have a broken heart. Um, something has happened, it breaks our heart. Um, there is actually a health condition um, that was first identified in 1990 in Japan that is called broken heart syndrome. Broken heart syndrome is something that occurs in individuals who are otherwise healthy, who do not have underlying cardiac disease, but they have been under an enormous amount of stress, usually something unexpected, maybe the death of a close loved one, uh, and with the release of a massive amount of those stress hormones uh, that we know come as part of the stress response, that fight or flight, 
they can actually end up having changes that lead them to have life-threatening symptoms that are similar to a heart attack and that actually change the shape of the heart in a way that is seen on imaging. So you can see here, um, there's that change where there's actually a dilation and the heart becomes a little bit rounder. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you can see it even more clearly here. Um, the heart on the left is normal. Um, the heart on the right is someone with what we call the broken heart syndrome or named for the uh, physician in Japan who discovered this, Takutsubo. Uh, so it's really remarkable. This is something that this person's health can return to normal within a few months with a lot of supportive care. Uh, but it's something that has now been well described all throughout the world. So what is it that we can actually do about this? I, I've spoken about the fact that we can see, well, it seems as though there are correlations uh, if someone is using mindfulness practice that maybe we can reduce their risk of having an asthma exacerbation, for example, um, or maybe we can help them manage their back pain. Um, what are some studies that have actually shown changes physiologically um, by medi kind of mediating that stress response. So on the next slide, we can see this is an example of a study that looked at veterans who had post-traumatic stress disorder. And in those individuals, they checked their stress hormone levels, cortisol, before they engaged in a mindfulness practice and, um, excuse me, in a mindfulness course for a few weeks, and then after. And what they ended up finding was, yeah, look at that. The stress hormone cortisol was lower after their mindfulness practice than it was before, as were their PTSD symptoms. Next slide, please. Uh, we also see that meditation and running, uh, that combination can be just as effective for managing mild to moderate depression as any medications. Next slide, please. For individuals who are trying to avoid getting themselves a viral respiratory infection over the winter, um, there are a number of studies now that show prospectively, meaning kind of starting with the intervention, um, that people who are engaging in a mindfulness course over the winter, in this case, they were a group of physicians, uh, they were less likely to develop a viral respiratory infection over the course of that winter than their colleagues who were on the waiting list for that course. Next slide, please. <clears throat> This is a study that was actually very seminal that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association a few years ago and led to a change in the guidelines uh, surrounding the management of chronic low back pain. So the guidelines now indicate that among the first line treatments for chronic low back pain should be mindfulness or mind-body practices because they've been proven to be so effective in managing chronic low back pain with very few side effects. Uh, next slide, please. We see also in individuals uh, with, with underlying coronary artery disease, with underlying heart disease, uh, that if they are taking part in a mindfulness practice, in this case, it was transcendental meditation, um, we actually see that not only do we see improvements in their metabolism of sugar and things of that nature, uh, we see improvements on their EKGs when they're doing stress tests on the treadmill. Uh, we also see improvements in how long they're able to stay on the treadmill. Uh, as compared to people who have been in the control group and didn't take those mindfulness courses. So these are really measurable results. Um, so you could go to the next slide, please, Anne. And the next one again. And the next, thank you. So, um, so here what we see is another study using transcendental meditation in cardiology. Uh, and I'm just going to mention for the moment, you know, I, I said earlier that the specific type of mindfulness practice doesn't seem to matter, and, and that's true. Uh, I think it's pretty clearly demonstrated that the type does not appear to matter. But certain types, certain areas of medicine have decided to focus on certain types of mindfulness practice. So in cardiology, a lot of the literature happens to focus on transcendental meditation. Um, this really seems to be for no other reason than everyone wants to be able to compare their research to everyone else's. So it's easy to keep it simple and use the same modality within, within that area of medicine. <clears throat> Uh, next slide, please. So I spoke about brain waves as being one of the suggested mechanisms by which this mind-body connection works. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you can see here that there are a number of different types of brain waves that are all named, that are all understood to be associated with different conditions of the mind. Um, the theta wave I'd like you to take a look at. Uh, 
When we see these, typically these are associated with creativity, a deep state of relaxation. Uh, in, in individuals who are not long-term meditators, these theta waves are usually seen in runs of two, three, usually no longer than that. In individuals who are long-term meditators, uh, when they are engaged in meditation and kind of hooked up to the EEG, the electronic encephalogram, uh, we see long, long runs of these theta waves, which are not seen under any other conditions. And so it's, again, an indication to us that, look, something different is happening when we're engaging in these mindfulness practices. Um, I'll have you go to the next slide, please, Anne. And so this is just one example. Um, what was seen in this study in individuals who were long-term meditators was that there were actually changes that were found um, on brain electrical activity um, that indicated more of this kind of deep theta state um, that were also associated with changes in immune response. Uh, so someone who got a flu vaccination who was engaged in these long, who was using these long-term meditation practices actually had a better response to the flu vaccination. Their immune system became stronger from it than someone who didn't. Um, we'll skip the next slide, please, Anne, and we'll go to the underlying anatomical correlate slide. Uh, so again, I mentioned that there can be changes in the volume of different parts of the brain. If we go to the next slide, uh, what we see here, these are actual images uh, where the white portions that are circled, um, these are portions of the brain that when all of the images from all of the study participants were taken and aggregated, those white areas indicate the actual volume of increased neurons in that part of the brain that deals with memory um, that were larger by that amount that you see there in people who are long-term meditators versus the people who are not. So again, these are things that we can see and measure. Um, next slide, please. Changes in DNA uh, and epigenetics, which are some of the ways in which the DNA are expressed, um, again, really fascinating. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see that there have been a number of studies now done, including this one, that look at the relationship between stress and telomere length. We can think of telomeres as kind of the caps on the end of your shoelaces. They kind of keep the shoelace protected and keep it from fraying. Our DNA has something similar. And so the longer our telomeres are, the more they protect our cells, and they're associated with younger, healthier cells. Shorter telomeres are associated with cellular aging. Um, and if we go to the next slide, what we see here is that there's actually a really direct connection between how much stress someone is experiencing at work and how long their telomeres are. Uh, so people who experience more work-related exhaustion have shorter telomeres. So that sounds like bad news, right? <laughs> especially for anyone who's experiencing any work-related stress. Maybe we don't want to be hearing that. Um, but if we go to the next slide, we see some good news, which is that actually this effect can be reversed. It can be slowed and it can, in fact, be reversed um, in this study and in some other studies um, through meditation and mindfulness practice. So we are aware of um, the possible implications, but we also know that there's a way that we can engage a solution. And I'm going to have you skip a couple of slides ahead and to the um, plus one slide with genomic and clinical effects. <clears throat> Let's see. And so this is another. Do you see it there? Which, which slide for sure? What's the title? Yeah, the slide genomic and clinical effects associated with a relaxation response. Let's see. see a couple of slides now. Not this one. Sorry, I just want to make sure I have the right one up for you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. So this was an interesting study that was done in individuals with irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease. And again, they put one group on a waiting list for a meditation course and another group on a list um, in which they actually started to take the class. And if we go to the next slide, this is kind of the punchline here. Um, what we see is these are on the left, this image is presenting a whole bunch of genes that we know are changed in people with inflammatory bowel disease. And the green and red, um, those are indications of whether those genes, those inflammatory markers, are more active than usual or less active than usual. What was found in this study that was really fascinating was that the genes that we know are associated with inflammation generally in someone with IBD, those genes in someone who had been taking the meditation mindfulness course uh, were actually less active than you would usually expect to find in someone with IBD. Uh, and the next slide, what we see is that those genes in these individuals that we know are associated with um, reduced um, with reduced inflammation 
and usually are very inactive in individuals with IBD. In those study participants who had taken the mindfulness course, those genes were actually turned up and more active than usual. So essentially in these individuals, we were seeing that they were expressing less inflammation than the, less of the inflammatory genes than you would expect and more of the anti-inflammatory genes than you would expect. And this is a study that's been replicated in many different conditions um, in several different publications. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. I mentioned microbes, and I know we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to be brief here. Um, but microbes pay, play a really important role in our health generally and seem to play a really important role in particular in kind of moderating this relationship between um, our mind and body and specifically between our mind and our gut. So if we go to the next slide, there is a really close relationship between the mind and the gut. The vagus nerve, which is the biggest nerve um, in, as part of the relaxation response in our body, actually goes directly from the brain to the gut. Um, and so when we think about things like getting ourselves into a rest and digest kind of state of mind, or when we think about having that sensation of butterflies in our stomach, um, this connection between the mind and the gut is why um, this exists. And if we go to the next slide, um, what we're talking about here literally is the importance of those little bugs that are in our guts and how they really connect to that mind-body connection. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is a really fascinating study that was done um, that I'll be brief about. Um, but what they did here essentially was they took a two lines of mice, um, one of whom were just kind of normal average lab mice, um, and the other line were mice that had been bred over generations to exhibit signs of anxiety. Um, we can talk about what that means in a mouse. There are all kinds of different ways that they express this, including things like hiding their food from the other mice and that sort of thing. Um, but essentially, we had our normal mice and then our mice that had been bred to exhibit anxiety. And what they did in this study was that they actually traded the bacteria in the guts of these two types of mice. And what they ended up finding was that the mice that had been considered the quote unquote normal mice, the average mice, they started to exhibit signs of anxiety. Whereas the mice that had been bred to be part of this anxious mouse family, um, those mice actually saw an extinguishing of their anxious behaviors. So it seemed as though the bacteria in their guts were really playing a very important role in that mind-body connection uh, and underscoring the fact that that connection really goes both ways, um, both from the mind to the body and vice versa. So if we go to the next slide, this is really the question, right? What does it all mean? <laughs> uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so I know this has been a little bit of a whirlwind tour, um, but just if we put it all together, really the underlying the underlying message of all of this research and all of these studies is really that we know that there is a clear two-way relationship between the mind and the body. And that has implications that we can measure, that we can see, um, all the way down to the cellular level. So in part, what this means is that being well, um, whatever that means to us, and it'll be a little bit different for everyone, um, it really requires not just that we bring our attention to our physical health, but also our emotional health. And when we are experiencing emotional stress, that can result in harm to our physical health, which can seem like a bummer, um, but, there, but there's good news here. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, the good news is what we've really seen. If we draw it out from these studies, understanding that there is this connection between mind and body, it's not just the bad news that if we're under stress that has negative effects on our physical health, it also is really good news because it means that we know how we can really leverage this connection to improve our physical health as well as our emotional health. So we can use these relaxation techniques like mindfulness practice to really improve our physical health and optimize it. And it also means that if we really are focusing on our physical health, on things like physical activity, healthy diet, probiotics, that can really go a long way towards helping to improve our state of mind. Uh, next slide, please. And just important to underscore, if formal mindfulness practice is for you, fantastic, have at it. Um, if it isn't, there are lots of other ways that you can tap into that relaxation response in a way that's specific for you and that you enjoy. Next slide, please. We have a lot of resources, tons of them that are out there. This is just a sampling of some apps that are, I think, useful and a good way to start. Um, most of these are free. Uh, some of them have some in-app purchases, and I think next month we'll be talking in a little bit more detail about some things that we can do here to really use this information. Um, next slide. 
Um, probiotics, just a word on this because I mentioned the mice. <laughs> um, generally speaking, uh, if you're going to purchase a probiotic, um, the refrigerated ones are probably a better bet, even though they are more expensive. Um, however, if we go to the next slide, um, supplements generally I'm not huge on, um, in part just because they're not well regulated. And also because I think we know generally uh, from a lot of the nutrition science that's out there that when we are able to get nutrients of whatever kind uh, through our diet, that really seems to do best for us. And I can say in my own clinical experience for my patients with conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, for example, most of them really do much better getting fermented foods into their diet than they do with probiotic supplements. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so just as a reminder, uh, we are going to be diving a little bit more into how we actually apply this information next month. Uh, and next slide, I happen to be a Calvin and Hobbes fan. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, <laughs> just a reminder that your, re your relaxation response can look a little bit different from everyone else's, and that's okay. Um, so I think we have just a few minutes. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, we do have some questions here. And thank you so much for all of this great. I love the science. I love that you showed us the science to show why. Not It's not just a good idea to engage in mindfulness. It's There's some real solid reasons <laughs> that back up this good idea, right? So thank you. Um, one question that came in was, is religious spirituality a form of mindfulness and meditation? And I know previously one of the slides it did mention prayer, but let me, what, what are your thoughts on spirituality as a form of mindfulness? Yeah, it absolutely can be. Um, so I, I do have patients for whom maybe their mindfulness practice is what we would refer to as mindful prayer. And uh, I think this really kind of goes back to that concept that truly anything can be done mindfully. Some things may lend themselves a little bit more easily to mindfulness than others. And I think we can imagine that prayer may be one of those things. Uh, but the idea really just being that if we are really present, intentional with where our attention is going, and really focusing on maintaining perspective um, rather than getting wrapped up in emotional reactivity, absolutely, uh, mindful prayer and spirituality practices can be a way of engaging in mindfulness. Great. Now, what about what if what if someone's in here on this presentation and they're like, I'm not sure if I have a mindfulness practice and I want to start. Are you are you suggesting? I know there's a whole variety of ways, right, from like yoga to meditation to maybe using one of those apps to even regular exercise, right? Like rhythmic exercise. What what do you think a good jumping off point is? Just a couple minutes a day of any mode, or what would you suggest? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think if there's something that really particularly speaks to you, go ahead, have at it. And as you said, starting with just a few minutes a day is a great place to start. And we increasingly have good evidence that if you're even using 10 minutes a day when you build up to it, you can get some real long-term health benefits from that. Um, it can be anything from one of the apps that I demonstrated, going out and taking a mindful walk where you're really just aware of your body's physical experience um, rather than all the things that are usually running through your head when you're walking. Um, it can really be anything. So if there's something that really particularly speaks to you, go ahead and start there. Uh, and it can be helpful to supplement it with something like an app that's a little bit more of a course and can help you to understand some of the principles and their applications in daily life as well. Um, Alternatively, if there isn't anything that's particularly speaking with you, uh, speaking to you, then I think it can be really helpful to just sort of try a sampling of things and see, okay, well, maybe I want to try the yoga, maybe Tai Chi, maybe I want to try something that's a seated meditation. Um, sort of try a few things and see what's right for you. The more different modalities that you're familiar with, uh, the more prepared you are uh, when you want to take advantage of them. Because there may be certain times at which you, you are more, you're just going to be more inclined to use one practice than another. Uh, it's always helpful to have more than one tool that you can go to. Yes, I agree. And along those lines, someone had asked if they can see this slide, this one, with the app suggestions. <laughs> Again, I actually <laughs> use several of these. I love the seven-minute cardio, and as a health coach, I recommend that to people just starting, but also the Calm app for sure is another one I'm familiar with. How do you, Dr. Baban, how do you practice mindfulness personally? So, you know, I am of the toolkit mindset. <laughs> so I have a number of different practices that are, feel like a good fit for me. And um, I do have sort of a set practice of sort of getting the day started with a few minutes of a formal meditation, because that's 
what feels like a good start to the day for me. Um, but when I'm going to be sort of going to another practice, it really just depends on what feels right for me in that moment and, and what I'm doing. Um, what ends up happening most often is that it depends on the day. Uh, if it's a really busy day, then I may go to just trying to be really mindful in whatever it is that I'm doing and having that be the practice. Uh, if I'm having a conversation with someone, for example, or I'm walking to a meeting, that's where my attention is. Uh, if it's a day when I actually can um, engage a little bit more, maybe that means um, doing a yoga practice or, you know, taking um, taking a hike um, rather than just taking advantage of a walk between meetings down a corridor <laughs> um, and using that as the opportunity to just really be aware and present of what experience my body's having, the feet on the ground and, you know, any birds singing, things of that nature. I love that. And I feel like in our fast paced, stressful world, we don't take time to do that. And you kind of have to choose to focus there and to take that time to get these benefits and to help us endure all the other that we do. So really true. I think once we start paying attention, it, it can be really shocking to realize how much we do not notice every day. Yeah, yeah. Like your first, like your introductory quote, which was, you know, mind blowing <laughs> as you wrap your head around it. But yeah, just taking that minute to notice is something I think in our day and age we don't do as much as maybe we used to, which is why these beginning a practice like this is so beneficial for us now. So, absolutely. It can be helpful in really grounding your day and making it easier to come back to that center in a way that I think many of us have kind of forgotten how to do because it it's just not part of our culture. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you are doing important work and this is really um, changing for people and I really appreciate this. As a health coach, this is a subject that comes up daily and I think a lot of our participants are really going to be able to use and apply some of the stuff you taught us today and I love how you've backed it all up with science. I am looking forward to, again, our our next um, presentation, which is on June 12th, where Dr. Raban is going to um, apply stress management. So it'll kind of take all of this and, and go further with it. So thank you again for joining us today and for everyone else who's joined us today as well. Um, if you have any questions, you can leave it on your exit survey and we can um, send those to Dr. Raban to maybe hit during our next presentation as well. So thanks again, um, everyone, for joining us today. We'll see you all next month. Thank you for having me, and It was a pleasure. I'm looking forward to next month. Yes, yes, me too. Thank you so much. And we'll go ahead and, and sign off. Bye-bye.